what I wanted to talk about this morning is um, several ideas about the transition between the old ways to reach the edge, the edge of the world, the, the people who have not had uh, access to information technology in the past. Uh, and uh, if you think about the various approaches we've had, one of the dominant patterns in the past has been to use telecenters, uh, to use public access spaces where people would come, find computers, and be able to use them. Uh, this has been going on for 15, almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, people are now starting to ask, is it a good idea? Is this working at all? Is this helping? in the developing world. And mostly they're asking this because there is this new technology, as Adela Ross uh, mentioned, of mobile phones, which is amazingly successful. Uh, some would say more successful than uh, the telecenters. And that seems to make them obsolete in many ways. That says, you know, why build these strange centers where people come to use computers if each one of them has a small personal machine that allows them to get access to the same information? Um, throughout these questions, what, uh, what is often the most vexing for us researchers is to understand the impact. You know, how do we go from using those technologies, making them available to people, to actually making changes in their lives? Uh, how do we know what is working, what is really having impact? Uh, so I'd like to address these three themes uh, this morning. And what I'd like to do is talk about first two studies uh, to... Uh, uh, to start introducing some of the, some of the issues. Uh, one, two studies I've been involved in, one that uh, Mireya just mentioned, one that is just starting, uh, which is the, the Gates, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation and IDRC, the Canadians uh, Research Center on Development, uh, which is looking at the impact of public access to information technologies. Uh, so telecenters, cyber cafes, libraries with computers, places where the public can come and use um, and, and use information technology. Uh, then to talk about mobile phones, I will briefly mention this, uh, the study uh, Miria was just telling us about, which, is, which we just finished. It will be released in a month. Uh, and I know that uh, Roxana will be presenting some of the, the work from, uh, from that study. So I won't spend too much time, but just give you um, a couple of highlights. Um, and finally, I will spend most of my time talking about this idea of appropriation. Uh, to me, one of the themes that uh, emerges when I, when I look at telecenters and telephones and, and how people use them to improve their lives uh, is how do they take the technology, reinvent it, change it, and make it their own, and how through that process they're actually getting impact, they're getting benefits from the technology. Uh, if there is one criticism I make to myself and to the, the rest of the development field in, in looking at uh, technology is that it's very often supply driven. It's thinking of, you know, we have a great technology, it's working for us in the north, wouldn't it be wonderful if we gave it to other people? And if they used it and they would become just as developed and rich and successful as we are. Uh, it often doesn't work that way and it's really interesting, it actually doesn't work that way in the north, but it certainly doesn't work that way in the south where it's very interesting to think about how people will take technology that was not initially designed for them and will reinvent it in ways that actually serve them. Uh, and if we're successful at doing that, there is a benefit, which is we get to learn things as well, and we get to learn from their use and get benefits from what they discover. Uh, so let me first start with this uh, telecenter. So if you think about the evolution of, of the hype or the enthusiasm about telecenters, it started about 15 years ago uh, and, and started rising. So people have invested and built many, many, many of these places. Uh, if you look at a country like Brazil, for example, there are over 25 different government programs building telecenters. Each one has several thousands of telecenters that have been built for Brazil. So you have you know, tens of thousands of these places in, in one country uh, where investment has been made, people have spent effort, etc. Uh, and, and, and you find the same situation in many places in Africa, many places in Latin America. Um, most of the studies that have been looking at those telecenters are somewhat skeptical. I mean, that people tend to say, well, it's not really quite working as, as we meant it. You know, the impact is not easy to show. Uh, and, and maybe those places will no longer be relevant in the, in the near future. For one thing, there is an expectation that people will be more able to get access to personal 
uh, computing and, and um, uh, information technologies, and therefore they will not necessarily need public places. Uh, that private access will replace public access. And second, there is, again, this enthusiasm for mobile phones, uh, which seems to replace uh, what, uh, what they are doing. So the, one of the questions that motivated uh, the Gates Foundation and the IDRC in this study is to understand whether we're now past this providing public access and whether we're in a, in a post-access environment, uh, as you may say. Um, and that's not clear because, again, there has been so far very few studies that have conclusively said anything about the impact in general. There are, again, many punctual studies. So, so this, this one that we're just starting is probably one of the first uh, well-resourced. It's about five years, um, but some, somewhere around seven million Canadian dollars, looking at several countries, uh, multi-countries, multi-year, to very systematically try to assess the impact of uh, telecenters. Um, again, I, I said that th there were some shortcomings of the previous studies. Uh, Arab Asse, who uh, is with us virtually today, one of our papers is being presented, uh, I believe, uh, this afternoon, uh, has done a, a very extensive literature review of all the literature on telecenters, which uh, you can look at. Uh, but what she concluded was that most of the studies look at fairly short time frames. They're trying to assess the impact in the, in the short term. Uh, they tend to look at limited geographies, not, not look at uh, more global uh, areas. They, most of them tend to assess the process of deploying telecenters. You know, how do we set them in place? How do they finance themselves? What exactly do they do? Rather than the impact they have uh, on people. Uh, often the assessment is done against the goals of the program. So again, it's very supplier driven. You know, here is what we think we're doing. We're teaching people to use Microsoft Word, for example. At the end, you look at impact as did they learn Microsoft Word. If they did not, then the program tends to be uh, assessed as a failure, whereas in fact, these indicators often miss the real impact. People have, may have done completely different things. Again, often what we see is that they have appropriated the technology, changed it, changed its purpose, and done things which were not necessarily the intention of the suppliers, of the designers of the technology, or of the people uh, who came up with the, with the programs. Uh, often this, this cartoon actually describes the dilemmas uh, we have. Uh, we have researchers on the left coming with all their good intentions, and their indicators that measure things usually uh, are very good at measuring numbers and quantitative uh, uh, outcomes. Um, and then they encounter people who are using the technology and who have stories to tell. Uh, those stories tell about the way in which they appropriate that technology and use it. And one of the challenges we have is to make that conversation happen, to make the two meet, to have evaluation techniques that uh, actually fit, uh, well, that, that can capture uh, what is in the stories. Um, so rather than have um, numbers or, or, or words, I, I thought I would give you a quick slideshow uh, of aspects of telecenters and uh, use that as a way to think about what matters about these public access venues. One of the striking, places, one of the striking uh, aspects of them is that they're really places. Uh, they're, and they're very diverse places. The characteristics of those places are very important. The, the social, uh, cultural, economic activities that go on within those places are key to the results uh, that people get from them. So on the top right, you have a, a cyber cafe in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, you don't see the computers. They're all the way at the back behind uh, the glass door. And, and that's the purpose of the, the center is to provide those computers. But people seem to spend a lot more time around the coffee machine and, and you know, having tea and discussing things. This is very much a community center. Uh, this is a place where people come and incidentally from using the computer will do other things. Uh, this, the one at the bottom right is, by contrast, that's also in Pakistan. It's a, it's a school uh, outside of Dhaka in one of the uh, uh, rural areas. Uh, and here, there is a very instrumental way of thinking about what the computer is for. Uh, it is for learning something. There are a few things you can do on this. Essentially, write a letter to do a job application, write a CV, uh, do an Excel spreadsheet, and that, that's about it. And this is being taught in that place in a very structured way. Uh, people are not looking at each other. They're all facing in the same direction. Girls are on one side, boys are on the other side. 
I'm not sure it's intentional, but girls get the white computers, boys get the black computers. Uh, so there is a, a structure of that to that place, an organization of the physical space that is amazingly different from the picture at the top. Um, and, and again, when I say places, some of these places are almost placeless in the sense that they can move. In Bangladesh still, uh, there are computer centers on boats. There are libraries and they have, the, the boats will travel the river and dock for a certain period next to a village and provide services during the time they're here. And then they move on to the next village. Uh, the one at the top uh, left is in, uh, is in uh, Kenya. Uh, again, a community center with, uh, with many people using um, these, these uh, public access computers. Again, m I, I could show many more, but there, the, the point is that there is a huge diversity to those places and that the characteristics of those places, uh, the way they're arranged, the way the computers either look at each other or not, uh, the way they're private or not, is, is extremely important uh, to what they do. So those, that's one of the things we'll be trying to capture in this study. Um, second is rules. Um, most of the time, when you use one of these places, there are things that are allowed and things that are forbidden. Uh, this one is, uh, is a striking example. That's the Central Library uh, of Santiago in Chile, um, where there are no rules. Uh, and, and I was amazingly surprised when, when I first went there. Those four kids you see here have come to the library. They've downloaded a multiplayer online game. Right? You can, I think they're playing Counter-Strike. I'm not sure which one it is. You can sort of tell from the, the right screen here. And they come here because they may have access to computers in other places, but this is the best bandwidth they can get fastest computers, and they come to the library and they will play games, and they're extremely proficient at this. Um, now, you know, in many other places, in, in, in Brazil, many of the government-sponsored uh, telecenters have banned the use of anything that is not educational. So anything like games, but also uh, the, this application that Brazilians love to use, Orkut, uh, which is a social network you know, like Facebook in the US, in, I guess. Um, uh, is often banned from the telecenters. What the result has been is people stop going. Uh, instead, they'd rather take money and pay to go to the cyber cafe that's down the street. And, and that simple rule about what you can do in the telecenters uh, in Brazil has been responsible for a, a huge growth of uh, what they call land houses, the cyber cafe uh, industry where people pay by the hour to use them. So again, what kind of roles do we have in those places is a really important aspect. Um, another one is whether there is help to be found. Uh, in this case, this is uh, also uh, in Chile, it's a small town's library. Uh, there is a person on the left that's helping with doing digital, uh, digital photography and building websites. Uh, in many places in India, you find intermediaries that will translate information that's found on the computers for population that may not be able to read or access them. So these intermediaries have a really important role and they are in addition to the technology. Um, sharing, uh, one of the big advantages of going to a public space is that there are other people uh, using the computers and that th as a result, we believe there is a fundamentally different pattern of use that emerges from joint use of computers, sharing the computers, whether people just give tips to each other and, and help each other learn the technology, or that they do things that they could not do on their own. Uh, in, in this example, uh, this is uh, how you play games uh, outside Kenya. This is the, the place from which you saw the, uh, the, um, uh, the facade earlier. Uh, and the kids, uh, have, you, know, you need to move the up arrow and the down arrow and the right arrow and the left arrow to move your character in the game. And they've discovered it's way faster if one does the up and down and the other one does the right and left. And they can absolutely beat the game this way. Uh, and they could not do that on a private computer. And, and to me, that's a wonderful illustration um, of you know, why would you go to a public place? And you know, we, we tend to think in the uh, Telecenter 1.0 world that this is a replacement for private use that you go to a public place because you don't have a private computer. In fact, there are many reasons to go which go much beyond that, which are to use computers with other people. The games are an example, but also applications of uh, social uh, networks, of interaction, creating things together. Um, training uh, is also something that is offered in many places. This one is a, a program in Chile where the telecenter trains people to repair computers, which 
uh, is, is also interesting for the center itself because their computers are fixed this way. But they also have a, a, a way to uh, exchange jobs and to list jobs. And this is, again, an important community center. Um, finally, one uh, uh, that, uh, is, that is interesting and, and gets back to, uh, to the, whether the mobiles are, are now uh, uh, supplanting telecenters is the interaction between telecenters and mobiles. Uh, the, uh, the, the two women you see here uh, spend time in a telecenter in Bangladesh being trained on how to repair cell phones. Uh, this is a two-week course, at the end of which they get this kit that you see on the top left, a uh, soldering iron, an amazing manual uh, that has the diagrams for most of the phones in the world. Um, I'm not sure what the intellectual property uh, roles are on this, but you can basically figure out how to fix anything that goes wrong. And they're actually able to fix you know, 90% of what can go wrong with, with people's phone. And they've opened a business to repair phones uh, in, a, in a village. They're also providing, um, you know, calls uh, that they sell per minute, but they were telling us that, uh, th that that provision of calls by the minute is actually a minor part of their business. Uh, most of what they make their money on is repairing phones. Um, the place at the bottom uh, is in, uh, in Ghana. Uh, it's, as you know, again, you f can find in many, many places in Africa, uh, public stands where people can come and buy a minute or two of phone call to, uh, to call somebody else. These are also replacing telecenters in a way because they are places. And again, the, the, the function they fulfill as a meeting uh, environment is an interesting one. Um, I could go on and on with these pictures, but uh, uh, just uh, as a conclusion to this first section, let me just summarize the, the structure of our research. Um, and so we're, for the moment, looking at uh, seven countries. We've, we've started the work in Chile, Bangladesh, and Lithuania, and we're just in the process of adding more countries. Uh, for each of these countries, we're doing uh, an inventory of these telecenters. Uh, this is something that has never been done, so it's, uh, it, it, struck, it struck us as interesting to know, well, how many of these places are there? Uh, what do they look like? How many are private? How many are public? Uh, how many have uh, helpers, intermediaries, or not? Um, that's a first step in being able to answer some of those questions. And we're about to do some surveys of users who come to these places and surveys of the people who run uh, these various places. But then, because we think that these uh, kind of traditional quantitative approaches are unlikely to get at all the richness of, uh, of the mechanisms, uh, we're starting a series of in-depth studies that will look at some of the mechanisms I mentioned. Uh, what is the place and the role and the function of intermediaries? Uh, what happens around the sharing be among end users? What are the, what for the moment we are calling non-instrumental uses and I'm really looking for a better word if anybody has a good idea, but it's anything that's not serious uses. Uh, so that includes uh, gaming, that includes social networking, IMing, everything you do on a computer that is not part of Microsoft Office, I guess, to, to caricature uh, what it is. And again, looking at t uh, the extent to which those applications are probably good ways to draw people into the telecenters, but maybe also good ways to learn things and to develop skills that might be just as useful as the more instrumental uses. Uh, we're also looking at uh, integrated impacts, uh, uh, aggregated impacts, and indirect impacts. Uh, telecenters have many impacts on people who don't go to the, to the places just because they tell somebody else to go there and look for information for them. Uh, and so we're looking at the impact those, those centers have on their communities. Um, and finally, we'll, uh, we're, we're starting to um, think about how do we look at mobile telephony within this, uh, both as a, as a substitute to the telecenter, but as a complement as well, or as a technology that coexists with them. Um, so through all this, uh, we're looking at multiple methods ranging from very quantitative to very non-quantitative, very qualitative ethnographic uh, studies. Uh, one of the important aspects of this project is that it is open research in the sense that we are planning to publish everything as we go, uh, in the sense that we're publishing methodologies, uh, questionnaires, uh, we're publishing data as it comes in, and uh, we know that we cannot address all those issues in all those places. So this is really an invitation uh, for the research community to come and help fill the gaps. Uh, we're trying to not do something that's completely systematic, but that's more impressionistic in a way that uh, uh, targets various uh, intersections between 
areas of impact, let's say agriculture, health, education, and mechanisms or countries. And we know that there will be many cells in that big multidimensional matrix that are empty. And that this is, again, an invitation for, for you to come and uh, live in those cells. I mean, no, that's not a very happy phrase, but, uh, but populate those cells in, uh, in the research. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the URL is here. Um, so, so that's t you know, some ideas about telecenters. The, the second thing I wanted to mention is the, very briefly this study uh, we just concluded on the impact of mobiles in Latin America. Uh, this again is a multi-method study uh, with some macroeconomic modeling uh, at the level of the subcontinent. We're looking at 18 countries. In, um, in Latin America, that, that's the work Mireya uh, has been leading. Uh, but then also looking at very uh, qualitative case studies, some targeting the organizational impact of cell phones uh, in Argentina and in Peru. You'll hear about Peru later today. Uh, some looking at more micro impact, and that there we looked at Brazil and Chile. Uh, Fundación Telefónica uh, helped support this work, and we have many partners uh, working on this. Um, just very briefly, you know, without uh, spoiling the release that will happen next month, uh, the key findings uh, of the macroeconomic model did confirm that there is indeed a very strong correlation between mobile penetration and economic indicators. And that's true of many economic indicators, whether you look at uh, income, whether you look at uh, economic growth. Um, second, uh, the, uh, the case studies confirm that there are indeed a number of new mechanisms, new economic mechanisms, uh, new organizational mechanisms that are made possible by cell phones. Uh, new revenue opportunities for many of the poor populations. Uh, the reduction in cost of doing business, transaction, transportation, organizations. And the emergence of new ways to sell goods and services, new commercial channels. Um, and finally, uh, at the micro individual level, uh, we, what was interesting is we've seen a, a wide range of modes through which youth, especially, but also marginal users. We, we've looked at uh, sex workers in Sao Paulo, street theater uh, performers. Um, uh, we've looked at young people in, um, um, in Chile. Uh, many different ways in which they have appropriated the technology often to negotiate power relationships, to figure out you know, how can they get more control over their life within the web of relationships they're embedded in. Um, in, in all this, so you know, a wealth of results, and again, it's a big report, so I, I will invite you to read it as soon as it's released, uh, but nothing that's, that's challenged what we expected in this. Uh, but probably the more interesting, to me, the more interesting result uh, is one that shows a dual picture that is, uh, that is probably unique to Latin America, or at least in, in my understanding of uh, what's happening in other parts of the world. That yes, on one side, if you look at the aggregate level impact of mobile phones, more penetration has led to economic growth and has had positive impact. Uh, that for groups uh, and individuals, you know, again, depending on which level of aggregation you look at, uh, the effects of cell phone penetration on income, well-being, autonomy are positive. This is a, generally a good thing. But what we've seen in uh, Latin America is that inequality has not decreased. In some cases, it's actually increased. And, and inequality has been, uh, for a long time, a, a very fundamental characteristic of Latin American society. The most unequal countries uh, are to be found in that, in that subcontinent. Um, and what was especially interesting to me was that this came out of the stories people told us of how, for example, uh, Brazil has a huge penetration of cell phones. It's about 70% of the population. Uh, most of it is prepaid, uh, again, very much like, uh, like Africa. Um, but Brazil also has the most expensive rate of prepaid cell phones in the world, whether it's phone calls or SMS. And as a result, people describe their cell phone as a pai do santo, uh, which is an expression that comes from the candomblé religion, where in the ceremonies of candomblé, some of the, uh, the individuals that will channel the spirits are visited by the spirits and start entering a trance. Uh, and that's the way the spirits communicate with the people. Uh, it's difficult to speak back to the spirits. The phones work the same way. 
sometimes somebody wants to talk to you and your phone vibrates, you know, enters a trance, and that usually means they want something out of it. And it's often very hard for you if you don't have credit on your phone to send anything back. Uh, so the, the message that comes out of it, the, the feature that, that dominates this, is one that is not of communication, but that's reachability. Uh, or connectibilidad, as I'm not sure reachability is a good translation uh, of what, what we described, um, which is people can be reached, they can be targeted, but they have a hard time being agents in that communication. And what we're seeing in Brazil, for example, is very often the rich people have postpaid uh, cell phones, they, they can call everybody. The poor people have prepaid cell phone and they wait to be called. So, so if you look at, for example, the structure of, uh, of rich families and their servants. You know, they will use cell phones to summon the cook and to summon the driver, uh, which is often, yes, an increased opportunity to make money, but also uh, a very unequal power relationship. It's very hard for the cook or the driver to start a network of their own where they offer their services to multiple bidders, for example, because they don't have enough credit uh, on their cell phones to do this. Uh, so, so again, I think that this duality of yes, uh, increase in income, increase in economic benefits at the global level. But if you look at the distribution, the rich seems to make off often better uh, out of the technology than the poor, and still an inequality that that uh, that is significant. Uh, again, I was saying that uh, this is shown at various levels. Uh, the stories tell it in the qualitative level, but Mireya did some very interesting analysis that looks at Gini coefficients uh, throughout the, you know, the inequality coefficient in economics uh, over the world. And if you look at the world globally, more penetration of cell phones leads to decrease in inequality for the Gini coefficient, except in Latin America, where it doesn't lead to decrease. And again, I think we've put our finger on something that, that's really interesting and, and worth exploring further. Um, so uh, um, I will stop here with, uh, with those two studies and then move to the, the main part of my uh, discussion here, which is throughout this look at telecenters and uh, at mobile phones, it seems to me one of the fundamentally interesting aspects is appropriation, the way in which people take technology and make it their own. Uh, so I'd like to talk about this and try to unpack this concept um, in, uh, in a few steps. First, talk about the inspiration for some of these ideas, which comes from cultural studies and especially Latin American cultures. Uh, then look at uh, appropriation mechanisms, especially with cell phone examples, but we could talk about uh, telecenters as well. And then think about how that fits within a model of innovation. Uh, and then if I still have time after all this, uh, talk about a few research questions uh, that come out of this. Uh, so, uh, from looking at various trends and various currents uh, of cultural studies in Latin America, there were three concepts that seemed to me very interesting in capturing the way in which people appropriate things, culture, power, economic resources. Um, and uh, the, the, the code words for these are baroquization, creolization, and cannibalism. Now, of course, you're wondering what cannibalism has to do with information technology, so I have to start by, by the last word here. And, and the story here is a Brazilian one. It's, uh, it takes us back to uh, 1556 when the Bishop Sarginia, uh, which means sardine, so he had an ill-fated name uh, to start with, lands and arrives from Brazil to what is now the coast of Bahia um, uh, on a beautiful ship uh, bringing uh, civilization and wealth to the natives. Uh, and religion, uh, and, uh, and arrives there, and, and the, the, the local inhabitants are so impressed by his power and his wealth that they want to appropriate it. They, they think it's a, it would be a good thing for them to have it. And they do it in the way their religion tells them, they eat him. Uh, by eating him, digesting him, they think they will get some of his power. And that first uh, story of cannibalism in Brazil is one that lives through Brazilian culture and Brazilian technology policy uh, to this date. Um, in, if you fast forward to 1928, uh, the poet uh, Oswald de Andrade uh, wrote what he called the Manifesto Antropofago, which is the founding document of, uh, modern, uh, uh, of the modern movement in, in Brazil. Um, where he says those cannibals in 1556 are the spiritual fathers of Brazilians. What we should do is take culture from all over the world, 
eat it, digest it, and recreate out of it something that's uniquely Brazilian. Uh, one of the sentences in this, uh, in this manifesto says, the only thing that interests me are those that are not mine. Uh, this is the law of man, uh, the law of the cannibal. You know, take stuff, digest it, recreate something unique. Um, what becomes interesting is that that uh, movement leads to a musical movement, a tropicalism, where people do that with music. Uh, the the uh, people who were very strongly part of this, uh, uh, this movement, such as Gilberto Gil, then become powerful within the Brazilian government and take that idea into information technology programs. So Gilberto Gil, was, uh, uh, as a minister of culture, creates a program called Cultura Viva that refers explicitly to Osvaldo Andrade and to, to, uh, uh, to the Manifesto Antropophago as the inspiration for creating telecenters. Uh, in those telecenters, he says, we will take technology from the world and we'll especially try to encourage open source technology and we will set up centers in which people can do anything. There will be no rules. Uh, they should come here, dismantle the computers, re-put them together in different ways, create uh, media, songs, music, uh, videos. Uh, those centers uh, called Pontos de Cultura are telecenters that break the mold of, of all the others. Um, now, we can study whether they're successful or not, but that what's interesting is this, uh, this mode of appropriation that's based on conflict and on, uh, on destruction of what you're trying to appropriate it to recreate it, so you get sort of creative destruction. Um, one of the, uh, the musicians that's part of the tropicalism movement is Tonze, and he describes here the composition of, of a song uh, where he, uh, he actually lost a competition, the, one of these festivals that uh, Brazil has quite often, and people accused him of plagiarism, and that's, you know, uh, he, he did, didn't really like this idea, and, and uh, uh, decided to create a song that was entirely plagiarized, that was only made of things that he stole from others. Um, and and uh, I just want to play a little bit of that clip because it's interesting. So he takes a melody from Chopin and a rhythm from Musica Popular Brasileira and creates something new. Mas eu disse assim, puxa, fazer uma música que seja toda plágio é uma ideia que pode ser interessante. Aí acabei fazendo uma música que foi toda plágio, a música seguinte do festival seguinte, ela é toda plágio e, e ganhou o festival também. E eu queria que... Bom, a primeira, o primeiro plágio é a harmonia, que é da, do estudo número 2 de Chopin, yes. que a harmonia é essa. Plagiarizing the harmony from Chopin. Que vocês, aliás, já conhecem na música popular brasileira, só batido um pouquinho diferente, que é assim. The rhythm from popular Brazilian music. É do estudo número 2 de Chopin. Ah, result. Insensatez Que você fez Coração tão sem cuidado Bom, então eu fiz com ela I'm going to stop it. I know it's frustrating because it's a nice song and we probably want to hear the rest. But uh, he then goes on to explain how he plagiarizes the words and, and how he takes ideas from everywhere else. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that this, this inspires itself from this idea of cannibalism, but is one that is closer to uh, what has been called creolization, uh, and especially by uh, poets like Edouard Glissant, uh, who describes creolization as a mixing that has an element of unpredictability, uh, as something that is not as hostile uh, as the appropriation by eating of the cannibal, but something that is more uh, open-ended and that will mix together various elements. Um, so here we have cannibalization as a way to appropriate that's extremely conflictual. Uh, creolization, that's one that's more gentle, and, and uh, I, I don't think you know, Chopin would really care if he knew that uh, his music is, uh, is being appropriated, as opposed to the bishop, who uh, I suspect did care that he was eaten in the process. Um, and then finally, there is another form of, uh, of appropriation that is found in many uh, manifestations in, in Latin America, uh, which is uh, what I would call baroquization. And here, it is appropriation that is encouraged, and even in some cases scripted, by the people bringing the wealth, the culture, or the technology. Uh, this is especially vivid in architecture. This is a, a church in Puebla, Mexico, uh, where you know, if you look at the, the left picture, it's amazingly ornate and decorated. And when you look at the details, what you see is that 
the uh, people who brought uh, the church from the old world encouraged the locals to inscribe their symbols within it. So the statue uh, of this uh, angel uh, character uh, has feathers on its head and it's resting its arms on tropical fruit and you can see you know, many elements that did not come from the old world but that were where there was a place for them. So many of these, these churches had blank spaces inside and outside uh, which were invitations for the locals to appropriate the architecture by inscribing their own symbols. Um, this is uh, one of the churches of uh, Jose Condori, which is uh, you know, one of the famous Quechuan architects who's built many of these uh, very interesting places. And again, um, I, I won't have time to read all this, but the, uh, you can see this character, this uh, mermaid character with a, uh, a Peruvian guitar, and you have symbols that, uh, that come from, from, uh, from that region of the world. Um, so what we have is, uh, out of these three modes of appropriation, they're having a diverse degree of conflict built into them. Baroquization, where the provider of the technology encourages appropriation and creates spaces for this appropriation. Creolization, where that happens almost independently, randomly, with unpredictable results. Cannibalism, where the appropriation happens through destruction of the original. Now, I need to bring you back to technology and you know, see what this has to do uh, with cell phones, for example. So we found many examples of bar baroquization, of doing this uh, extreme inscription of personality within the blank spaces of the technology. Decoration of cell phones, attachment of things to cell phones, all the way to uh, what you have on the right where it's hard to know what are we looking at. Is that a cell phone with things attached to it or is it things with a cell phone attached to it? Uh, so in some cases, even baroquization can take over. So the, the appropriation can take over the, uh, the, the scenario or the, the initial intention of the provider of the technology or the culture. Um, Providers are always encouraging us to appropriate uh, their products by make, personalizing them, making them our own, uh, changing the ringtone, the, uh, the screensaver, etc. Uh, in some cases, there are some intriguing uh, services that will help customize something for you if you can't really do it yourself or don't have time. There is a service in the users uh, in the U.S. Uh, where you can schedule fake calls. Um, uh, for example, you want to, you know, you're going to a, a meeting with somebody you want to impress, and you think it would be really nice if your art broker called you from Paris at that time uh, to pretend that he's selling you uh, a Gauguin and that you know you're in, totally involved in the conversation. So you can actually schedule that on this service. And the person, on the other hand, uh, on the other side of the phone, will whisper to you French phrases that you can reply, so you can again impress uh, the person you're having lunch with what you're doing. They will uh, send you fake pictures of girlfriends to put on your screensaver, uh, fake messages that make you look interesting, etc. So again, personalization that can be done by, by others. Um, so creolization, uh, one of the interesting aspects of cell phones is that they've been combined with uh, mobile technology, with transportation technology in many parts of the world. Uh, the top pictures um, here from Arabase show bicycle phones that you find in Ghana where the mobile phone has been grafted onto a bicycle and the bicycle will go to uh, populated places and sell phone calls uh, with this. Um, on the bottom, it's a Kenyan a wheelchair rider who did that on his own and who has a cell phone encased in what looks like a real phone uh, and is reselling cell phones by going to where the people need them. The one on the left is uh, is a fake picture, but it's a good story. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a ferry boat across uh, Lake Victoria that goes from Tanzania to Kenya. And while you're being ferried, you can call from this fake phone booth that actually is connected to the mainland. Turns out this is a picture that uh, was uh, staged by MTN, the local phone company, uh, as a way to do advertising. But still, uh, it, it is a nice example of this curlization. Um, we find also a lot of mixing of power and phone technology. Uh, Here is a backpack that has solar cells in it and that uses the phone system as a way to provide a Wi-Fi cloud. That's uh, not in a developing country. That's something um, one of our partners in LA has been uh, uh, developing, which is kind of a way to take your Wi-Fi cloud on your back when you go to demonstrations. 
Um, but also, I mean, as, you, as you know, many ways to recharge cell phones in public places in Africa, ways to redesign cell phones so they have longer battery life. Uh, again, a lot of uh, complex appropriations that have to do with, uh, with, uh, self, with, with electric power and cell phones. Also, uh, appropriations have to do with the, the context within which the phones are used. What you find in many places, the left one uh, is again in Ghana, the right in the Philippines, is combination of phone-based activities with other activities. Uh, in, uh, in Ghana, you can get your phone fixed while you're getting your hair cut. Uh, you know, how the two came together, I don't know, it's probably it takes just about the same time to do each activity. Uh, in the Philippines, you can get your nails made to match the decoration they will make on your phone uh, in the same shop. So you know, today is pink day, your phone becomes pink and your nails uh, will become pink. Uh, again, mixing that are quite unpredictable in uh, the, the way people appropriate these technologies. And finally, the third mode is one that's more hostile and more destructive. Um, this is a picture that was taken in Tanzania. Um, uh, or actually, no, uh, in, in just outside of South Africa, uh, which, uh, uh, which shows a, a solar panel that was appropriated by uh, a resident uh, hooked up to a battery in their house and that was powering everything in the house, not just their phone, but uh, their stereo system and everything else. Uh, if you look closely at the, uh, at the picture, it's, it's not very easy to read, but it says warning, this is the property of telecom, etc. So it's very clearly something that has been taken down from that, that probably was powering one of the cell phone relays in, in South Africa, and now is powering somebody's house. Now, this is appropriation in a way that's destructive to the intention of the technology providers. That's completely antagonistic. Um, the uh, uh, other, other ways of doing this, you can uh, find in many places in Africa and India, uh, China as well, shops that will offer to reprogram your phone, change it, customize it, uh, and especially uh, make it possible to use several SIM cards within one phone uh, which was not initially designed that way. So you can actually defeat the purpose of the, of the provider and, and the, the pricing plans that may not fit your interest. Uh, you can buy this online from China, which will yet, you let you inscribe the information from 16 different SIM cards onto one SIM card. So then you put it on your cell phone. When you turn it on, it asks you which one do you want to use today. And uh, again, that's, uh, there is a, a very long text in fine print that comes with this that says this may be illegal in many places. You know, use it as your, at your own risk. But this is something that becomes possible. Again, an example of cannibalism in the sense that this is appropriation and innovation that's hostile to the provider of the technology. Uh, or the provider of the service. Uh, even more hostile, I guess, is pure distraction. This is uh, the iPhone. Uh, a few days after it was released, a number of people uh, decided to break it open to see what was in it and, and understand it and try to uh, re-engineer it so they could defeat the uh, locking mechanisms that uh, Apple had, uh, had built into the iPhones. Uh, so you find many uh, description films of how they broke their iPhones. This one is not a very subtle one, but some are much uh, clever uh, reverse engineering. Uh, finally, probably what, what to me is the most uh, vivid example of cannibalism. This is uh, a picture that we, we can't see because it didn't work, but this is uh, a bomb, uh, a, a telephone used as a detonator for a bomb. And, and you can vaguely read that uh, it has one missed call. And essentially, they called it to make it explode and, and something didn't work. Uh, but here again, it's uh, uh, appropriating the phone, reinventing it, creating a new use for it that is completely antagonistic to the provider, antagonistic even beyond the provider to the society uh, that, that uses it. Uh, but again, extremely innovative. So uh, interesting ways to think about how the technology can fit within people's lives. Uh, so uh, if you think about these various modes of information, of appropriation, it's useful to think of how they fit within the cycle through which technology is used. So typically, technology is made available. It's rolled out by the suppliers. Um, then users can adopt it or not, but once they adopt it, their next stage is one of appropriation, of taking it, transforming it, and making it their own. Uh, then they do things that are new and the providers can decide 
whether or not to reclaim that, those ideas, whether they want to, you know, to inspire themselves from what the users have invented, to block it, to change it, to adapt it. But there is an, op an opportunity for the technology providers, the telecenter creators, the phone companies to learn from their users and think about what else they could do to, uh, to build upon this. Uh, after which they might release a new uh, version of the, of the technology and we start a new cycle of this. Uh, one of the elements that's, uh, one of the uh, areas in which this is extremely vivid and interesting is mobile banking. Uh, in Africa, and this is an example that's now well known, but I think is very instructive to look through this cycle. Um, essentially, uh, mobile technology was rolled out in Africa with you know, GSM standards and recharge cards initially. Um, pretty much like all over the world, no, nothing surprising here. What's unique is that in several places in Africa, mostly East Africa and somewhat in South Africa, people appropriated that as a banking system. They thought, you know, instead of just buying a card, entering the code in my phone to get more credit, what I can do is buy the card, enter the code into an SMS, and send that message to somebody to whom I owe money. And that's, all of a sudden, it's a money transfer mechanism, right? And that's what they call sente, you know, sending money to somebody else. This has been extremely successful in, uh, in Africa, Some, uh, something that's been used very widely by people who have never had access to a banking account, uh, who had no way to send money to relatives who lived in a different village or to transfer funds. Um, now, the next step is interesting. The phone companies in Africa have seen an opportunity there and have decided that this is a service they want to offer. Uh, so in Kenya, Safaricom calls this service Sambaza, and it, it is, you, know, you are able to take credit on your phone and transfer it to somebody else as minutes. I wish I was able to do this in Europe, by the way, it's, uh, in, you know, or, or in the US. It's, uh, it's something that, that's really missing from, from our world. Um, and in South Africa, a company called Wizit actually did that but took a banking license and is now able to convert mi uh, minutes completely openly with money. So you can actually you know, pay your bills, buy things on the market, etc. So now you have a new banking system that's built upon the cell phone. Now what's interesting is to see what comes next. You know, once you have this banking infrastructure, thinking about how will that be appropriated next. Um, some of the, um, the examples that were interesting um, have been during the, the recent unrest in Kenya. Uh, some of the human rights organizations have used these systems as a way to provide credit to people who were reporting on events in local places and didn't have credit on their phone. So if you participated and sent stories, you could be paid in minutes uh, through a system like Sambaza. Um, the, you know, again, after this, uh, this appropriation uh, phase, uh, we have a, an opportunity for the, the providers to reclaim the innovation uh, in the same way as Wizit and, and uh, Safaricom did. And here, in the same way as we had three appropriation modes, we have three modes of reclamation, of taking back uh, by the providers. They can either co-opt the technology, the invention from the users, they can adapt it, you know, change it, and creolize it in some way, or they can block it if they don't like it, if it's something that they think is antagonistic to their, proje their product or, or their idea, they can decide to, uh, to uh, prevent the users from, uh, from using this. And, and these three modes of reclamation echo the three modes of appropriation we just discussed. So in the end, we have this uh, cycle uh, through which technology goes. Uh, technology comes out, users appropriate it, they can appropriate it in ways that are more or less antagonistic to the provider of the technology, and the, tech and the suppliers of the technology, the, the people who bring telecenters and cell phones, uh, can decide what to do with it, how to react, and create new technology. I think it's especially interesting to think about this cycle because of the evolution of the technology it creates. It's an iterative cycle, or you built cumulatively upon the various uh, rounds of innovation. Uh, it's uh, very strongly driven by the end users who have a lot of uh, amazing ideas about what can be done with uh, computers and cell phone. Uh, it ends up creating structured learning in the sense that you learn through the structure that is put in place uh, in that infrastructure. Uh, much of the knowledge that comes out of it becomes embedded in the technology itself, and it's important to think about how that happens, you know, how telecenters start being modified by the users and, and, being, and start being a repository for what the users know 
uh, in the same way for the cell phones. And it's path dependent in the sense that history really matters here, that uh, the path you take to uh, follow this innovation really matters to the outcome. Uh, so briefly, I just want to conclude, uh, since I'm at the end of my time, with a couple suggestions about uh, possible questions. Um, and especially as we're thinking about the way in which information technology leads to development and to uh, improving people's situations. Um, so one of them is, you know, what is open in the technology we create? What are the possibilities, the spaces, the affordances that we make available for appropriation? And I think we seldom think about this enough. We tend to think that we understand what the technology is for and that we need to just teach people how to use it. Uh, and I think it might be more successful to often think about, well, how can we create it in ways that is non-scripted so that they might be able to invent what it's good for and then tell us what it's good for. Um, a second place where there are some interesting questions in the, is the next phase of reclamation. Now, what remains open and what are the mechanisms that we can think of to then take inventions from users and take inventions both in technology but also in uses, in applications, and then reclaim them in constructive ways and make them more permanent within the systems. Um, and you know, so what are the political economies, what are the industrial structures that make sure that invention that has happened for appropriation doesn't get locked up in individual carriers or individual places or individual users, that it can then be shared through the system. Um, ultimately, I think, uh, I, I know I do need to do a lot more work on exactly what is appropriation. I was gonna say we need to, make more, to do more work, but I don't need to tell you what you should be doing. Uh, but it's really this, this idea of appropriation with a, a huge number of questions. Uh, you know, who are these users we're talking about? What motivates them? Uh, what resources can they draw upon in, in, uh, in this appropriation? How do they do it? Uh, can they get help from others, other users or helpers, intermediaries, etc.? cetera? Um, how do they go about their invention process? Um, how do they share their inventions? What impacts does this have, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and to me, it's uh, through the, the better understanding of this phenomena of appropriation uh, that we'll be able to have a better sense of how to deploy information technologies so it has an even greater impact uh, in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you.